Welcome back everybody to We Get Macro uh, here at the channel where we're going to be posting the, posting the videos of our eControl 2 class moving forward. And uh, like I said, this is going to be a lot of adjustment for all of us. It's the first time doing a class like this as well. Um, so let's keep in touch. Let's keep talking. Uh, let me know if anything is not working on your end or if you think something could be done uh, in a way that uh, would maximize your, your learning experience because uh, that's the intent here. Let's continue to learn. Even though the pandemic is... Uh, uh, unfortunately sad that the situation that's all happening, uh, let's take it as an opportunity. And like I said, we're gonna be able to apply all those, what's going on in the world right now to what we're learning uh, in, the, in the moving forward, okay? Uh, so today we're gonna talk about savings investment in the financial system, okay? We already talked about this a little bit by applying the demand and supply model into the market for vulnerable funds. Uh, as if, if that does not ring a bell, please go back uh, to our chapter uh, where we studied that or also feel free to go to the end of the slides okay at the end of the slides um, i added a review session which you could um you could look at that uh, and try an exercise to see if you were if you're understanding it or not okay um so okay so of course i'm using my ipad to take some notes uh and kind of work like the, as a whiteboard and hopefully you it'll work well okay if i need to uh zoom in and zoom out we'll, we'll go from there Okay, so what is the financial uh, system? The financial system is nothing more than a system where financial markets take place. Financial markets are places where financial institutions operate. Now, what, what is a financial institution, Eddie? Well, a financial institution uh, can be think of as a, as a financial intermediary, so a middleman, okay, that connects both borrowers and savers. Uh, so borrower is the person who is trying to acquire funds, and uh, he knows that uh, he doesn't have that money right now, so he was willing to pay a little bit more in the future to be able to borrow that money right now from somebody else or, another, or from an institution, well, right? And the saver in this case, he has enough money to pay for his expenditures now and then is saving for the future. And because as we talked about inflation, uh, quick review is uh, decreasing the purchasing power of, of, of money. Uh, we know that our money is gonna keep devaluing if we put it under our mattresses, right? Uh, so we tend to, we put it in a savings account or we, uh, we, we loan it somebody else in exchange for a return, right? We're trying to offset this decrease in the purchasing power of inflation over time, okay? Uh, so the financial system uh, is the place where uh, this financial intermediaries operate and, um, in, in financial markets, and there's several of them. Uh, on the first, the beginning of the semester, we just used one to simplify everything, but now we're gonna dive more into different types of them, okay? Uh, by your surprise, uh, we're gonna be here to talk about bond market, stock market, and start getting two banks as well, okay? Okay, so let's move forward. So, like I said, a very quick review of what we've done before. Uh, here we're gonna be, uh, think about how to apply that demand and supply model, right, uh, to, this, to this market. So in this case, the supply of this market, right? The supply of this market comes from savers, right? So people that are saving, uh, that have more money that are saving for future consumption, right? And the demand curve in this case, is gonna come from the borrowers, right? So in this case, that's the people that are trying to get loans. Um, they're, well, they're, the, the quantity that we're looking into here that's being uh, uh, transacted between borrowers and savers is financial capital. Right, or you remember recalling the uh, market for loanable funds, market for loans, right? So uh, that's one way to think about it. And the interest rate is gonna be the price. So if you remember correctly, we have our good old demand and supply where supply is upward slope, demand is downward slope. Make sure you guys know why, and we've applied that to every graph so far, right? Um, and as you can see, the interest rate is the price, which is in the y-axis here. So based on this model, we can then predict the optimal interest rate and the optimal quantity. Okay, uh, the first two examples I'm gonna look into is gonna be the stock market and the bond market. Uh, so right now, um, since we do not have those group discussions anymore uh, because of the way classes is right now, uh, I still love them. And I think I thought they were the most useful ones because you get to see how everybody's understanding the material. So we're gonna continue to do them through the virtual classes, okay? Uh, so the way I'm gonna do, please stop the video whenever you see that I'm gonna do something like this and I'm gonna stop on my end too so you know it's a pausing period. And uh, I want you to look at this video and to the introduction of, of, of uh, the bond market and try to solve the, the, the exercise. And if you have any questions, we can talk more about it during the virtual classes, but it should be pretty straightforward to find the answer for this one, okay? And so I'm gonna pause it now so you know that it's your turn to do some work. Okay, so hopefully uh, you enjoyed the video as well. I think it's very informative and you're able to get to the answer that 
is A. That means that uh, large corporations tend to borrow money through the bond market uh, because it is cheaper than borrowing from banks. Okay, so let's understand what is, what is this bond market that, that was discussed there. So the bond market here is just, bond is a certificate of indebtedness. So it's, it's a debt, it's a contract of debt, right? Also known as IOU. Uh, so it's a contract which, in this case, think about this large, cor this large corporation wants to borrow money, right? Let's say it wants to borrow uh, $1 million in, in bonds, okay? And let's say it's gonna issue 1,000 bonds. Or sorry, let's just, yeah, I thought that's, that's the issue last. Let's do, oh, that's the part that I have to go back. I'm gonna keep, then I can hop back in, guys, and now I can change to eraser and things like that, hopefully. Okay. Okay, so, well, let's just continue with a thousand. So if there's a thousand bonds that they're issuing and they're trying to get a million dollars, that means that each bond is gonna be hundred dollars, right? So if you wanna buy a bond from this corporation, meaning that you're giving them a loan, right? So in this case, when you think about buying a bond, you're the saver, okay? You're the saver. So a hundred bucks gonna be each bond and there's gonna be an interest rate, which let's say is 2%, which is the cost of that loan. Okay, so there's a maturity date, the date of maturity, which is when that person, uh, the, the corporation in this case, has to pay back this debt. Okay, uh, so in this case, that's a maturity date and the term, the amount of time uh, between when the contract is signed until when it has to be paid back, that's gonna be called a term and it's in a, in a slide moving forward. Okay, uh, this type of finance is known as debt finance. Okay, why? Because you're financing your investment through debt contracts. Okay, so we're gonna be calling this of that finance. And as you can see, you can borrow this from the public. So why is this so good? Well, imagine uh, you had you, this large corporation, let's say Starbucks wants to borrow a million dollars to expand, right? Uh, based on this million dollars, it's gonna be really tough to find one individual. And that individual is gonna charge a lot because it's a lot of money that he's not gonna have contact with until the maturity date, right? So what is the easier way to do this? Well, what about if we split this big amount of a million dollars between a thousand bonds? Now we need a thousand investors that can invest a uh, thousand bucks each. Sorry about that. A thousand bucks each, right? And if we, each investor should do a thousand bucks each, uh, then now it's a lot easier to find a thousand investors that can do a uh, thousand bucks each, right? Uh, and in this case, each investor would pay 3% uh, since that's the interest rate for this bond, right? So not only corporate large corporations can do this but also government institutions okay so municipal governments can do this uh to uh, raise money for infra infrastructure projects as well right uh, federal the federal government does this this is also we call the u.s uh federal government bonds or also known as u.s treasury bonds right i just want to point out how important the treasury bonds is okay treasury bonds in this case are seen as the, the safest type of bond why we're going to start connecting the risk of default with interest rate in this case Okay, so as you believe, as the belief that uh, a bond or an investment is riskier, meaning that you won't get paid back, we tend to ask for a higher interest rate, right? Uh, and to be compensated for the higher risk, right? So if you think this way, let's think that every time uh, you think about how those two correlate, as the risk of default goes up, so should go the interest rate, the return that you ask on your investment, okay? So why is this important? Because Treasury bonds is known to have one of the, the lowest interest rates of all the bonds. Why? Because it is seen as the safest type of bond. Why? Well, if you think that uh, a company is doing well and they are very likely to pay you back, imagine the government in which that, that company uh, is located in, right? If the US government crashes, everything in the US economy will probably crash, right? So this is why we tend to think that, hey, it doesn't matter what's going on, the last person who's gonna fail is probably the US government. Uh, also because of the power and reputation and the strength of the dollar, right? Uh, all important factors uh, to decide where to invest in the bond. Okay, uh, so the maturity date, or just to complete the maturity date then, uh, each, the corporation would have to pay back $1,030. Uh, so $1,000, uh, that is the principal, the amount borrowed, plus 3%, which is of that value, which is the cost of that loan. So uh, the corporation, even though it needs a million dollars, you would pay back a million dollars plus 3% of that as the cost of that loan, okay?
I'm going to talk about how the interest rate is, is determined furthermore as well. Okay, so as I said, I mentioned what the term is. Uh, I mentioned what the credit risk is, is that the probability of default, and we connected how a higher interest rate equals the higher probability of default, uh, right? But how, how would you evaluate that? Well, bonds in this case, they're evaluated uh, through rating agencies, right? Uh, one way to do it is that you could go and search information about the financial uh, statements of, of a company, of the government, see how they're doing, but there's also a, a summarized way of all this, right? So there has to be a more efficient way for us to see which bonds are out there and not have to investigate each one independently. Although I still, I still recommend that you do know what you're investing when you go that way. Just don't look into the, this, this ratings that I'm about to show you and decide from there because they have shown to be, they have been shown to be imperfect uh, as we saw in 2007 during the Great, great Recession. Okay, and we'll talk about that later on. Um, so how does this, how does this uh, rating works? And I'll just skip to it really quick so you can see it, and I'll go back to the other one. But literally, yeah, they're rated in terms of letters. So from these, the worst, worst means higher risk of default and higher interest rate, right? So now remember that there's that trade-off. Uh, and as you go up in terms of D, C, double C, triple C, all the way to triple A. Triple A are the safest type of bonds. So guess where U.S. Treasury bonds are? Right here. Okay. So this is where U.S. Treasury bonds are. Now, does that mean that every government is triple A? No. No, it doesn't. Okay. For example, Argentina defaulted on, on its debt uh, during this past two decades, right? So that means that now there's a lot lower supply, people willing to supply funds for Argentina, okay? Which means that they have to pay a lot more to be able to get that, okay? To acquire uh, money to be able to run its activities through, through bonds, okay? Now going back, if they have the safest type of bonds, do we also have, oh, there we go. If we have the safest type of bonds, what are the worst? And the, the worst is what we call the junk bonds, okay? So those are extremely, extremely likely to default, okay? And that's why they tend to offer very high interest rates, okay? Um, to finalize in terms of bonds, uh, uh, I wanna make connection with time as well, okay? I, I did add here in terms of tax treatment, uh, just to point out that some of them do have some differences in terms of, of tax treatment. For example, municipal bonds don't have to pay taxes, but all other uh, income made, made from bonds are, are taxable, okay? Uh, so moving forward, one thing that I wanna point out uh, is how not only the risk of default is important, but the risk of default is also connected to the term of the bond. What I mean by the term? Well, how much does a 10-year-old, a 10-year term treasury bond pay versus a three-month-old? So one would be that I buy, I buy my bond right now. I'm lending money to the U.S. government, right, the federal government in this case, and they're going to pay me back in three months in the case of the three-month term, or in 10 years in the case of 10 years one. Okay. Uh, so the idea here is that as uh, we tend to think that longer periods of time are more uncertain because it's hard to predict what's going to happen in 10 years versus in three months, right? It's more unlikely that we'll get it right, usually. And that's why we tend to see that the blue line tends to be above the red. But you can see that they do change a lot, and especially right before recessions, right? Take a second to think about this. Before a recession, we know things are going kind of odd. We expect things to go really bad. So we can't really predict what's going to happen in three months versus in 10 years. They're both very, the three months is very negative prediction right now, right? So because of that, we tend to ask for a higher return. So that's why we tend to see a warning from through the, for the interest rate of uh, spread uh, across the 10 years and three months uh, treasury bonds that it tends to be a signal that we're about to hit some trouble because people are expecting uh, something better to happen. Okay, uh, so this is it for the bond sign. I also added there how to compare bond and inflation so you can get an idea about how they move together, but we're not gonna focus too much on this right now. Okay, uh, the next video is gonna be about the stock market. So uh, this is where we're gonna move from there. Sounds good.